chapter actually contains what looks like a formidable amount of schedules. There are 10 schedules, but they're all part of a master budget, and really, it's not that difficult. Watch how nicely this all fits into place. We start with a sales budget. I think we can remember that, right? The sales budget will lead to a production budget. Now, I'm drawing this a little bit differently than what's in the chapter because that chapter's diagram is a bit misleading. We do the production budget. Well, what are the three big production costs? Remember, we covered these. What are our product costs? Raw materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. So once we have the production budget, we do the raw materials budget, the direct labor budget, and the manufacturing overhead budget. I think we can remember that. Production because it's a product cost. And we require all three inputs in the production process. But we also have, besides product costs, we have period costs. So we'll do a selling and administrative budget. This is easy to remember. Sales budget tells us how much we need to produce. To produce, we need raw materials, direct labor, and manufacturing overhead. There's our product cost. If we have product costs, we must have period costs. And the sales budget will drive the costs in selling and administration. Once we have this, here's six budgets out of the ten done. Once we have this, now we're in a position to do the ending inventory budget. Why? Because we need a dollar value for the ending inventory. But to get a dollar value for the ending inventory, we got to know how much in raw materials went into each unit, how much of direct labor, how much of manufacturing overhead. So it's not that the ending inventory budget is driven by the sales budget. It's driven by everything else after the production budget. Once we have these seven, we can now do a cash budget because raw materials cost money, direct labor costs money, manufacturing overhead costs money, selling and administrative costs money, and sales generate cash. So we have a source of cash and we have uses of cash. So you can't develop the cash budget until all of these other things are done. Once we're done that, all that's left is the income statement, the budgeted income statement, which is driven from the sales budget and all of our cost budgets, and the budgeted balance sheet. And we will see that as we go through each of these budgets, especially with the cash budget, um, we will enter in, we will fill in most of the lines for the balance sheet and the income statement automatically. So it's not like these are done purposely, they're done just as a matter of fact of doing the rest of the budgets. In other words, each budget that we do fills in some line in the income statement or the budgeted balance sheet. Well, we're going to walk our way through the production, uh, the uh, budget schedules for the master budget. And before we start, we have to start with the balance sheet for a particular company. We're going to use throughout this chapter Patterson Framing. Here's their balance sheet for December 31st, 2014. And we're going to need this because there are some amounts here that become our balance forward for some of the different schedules. Cash is going to be important. Accounts receivable is going to be important. We're going to see how the raw materials and finished goods inventory, how these numbers become important. And when we jump down to liabilities, our accounts payable will become important as well. So let's just jump right into it. Here is our sales budget and everything starts from the sales budget. And let's uh, let's have a look at how this is broken down. Notice that the dates in here, it's for the year ending December 31st, 2015. The balance sheet that we looked at was for the year ending December 31st, 2014. And we're going to need some numbers from that balance sheet for here. We start with our budgeted sales in units. I should mention that the, the budget we're looking at has two parts. Part one is the upper part that I'm circling with my mouse here. Part two is this schedule of cash collections. We'll get to that. Right now I want you to focus on the first three entries up here. Our budgeted sales in units. So looking across all levels of management and building uh, our forecast for the year, it is felt that the first quarter will have 20,000 units sold building to 60,000 to 80,000 in year th in uh, quarter 3 then dropping to 40,000 in quarter 4 so we could see that sales for this company are highly cyclical 
First quarter is not that great. Third quarter is fantastic, and then it drops again to the first quarter. The selling price per unit is $30. Now, there's an assumption here that the selling price for the year will not change. That may not be realistic in the real world, especially if you're dealing with cross-border uh, purchases, different currencies, selling in one currency, buying in another currency, or if you're in a business where sales are driven primarily by promotions or discounts. So this, this may not be realistic, but this selling price of 30 a unit may represent an average price over the course of the year. There may be lower prices in, in quarter three to spur sales and higher prices in quarter one uh, uh, to re reflect the fact that, well, not much is going on in that quarter. It's not worth <clears throat> doing any promotions in that quarter anyways. When we multiply the two together, you get our total budgeted sales. And that's some through the year. So through the year, we expect that we will sell 200,000 units at an average selling price of $30 for total budgeted sales of $6 million. Fabulous. This first line becomes an input to another budget. If we're, we're going to sell this many units, we have to make at least that many units. So we can see where that's going to go. Let's deal with the schedule of expected cash collections because this can get tricky. If we're going to sell 600000 in the first quarter, we need an assumption as to how we're going to collect the cash for those sales. If we're in a business where every sale, cash is collected immediately, then we don't have to worry about that. The total budgeted sales would be the cash that we expect to collect in that quarter. But if we sell on account, we may not get paid in that quarter. So we need an assumption of how cash is collected, and here it is. This company assumes that 60% of all sales in the quarter will be collected in that quarter, and 40% of all sales in that quarter will be collected in the following quarter. So of the 600,000, 360 will be cash that we collect. Remember, we're doing a schedule of expected cash collections. It will be cash that we collect in this quarter. 40% will be collected in the second quarter. So when we add these two together, we get 600,000, which is the total of 600,000 here. That's first quarter sales. Then we, our next line would be second quarter sales. When do we expect to, to collect that? Well, it's 1.8 million. 60% will be collected in quarter two. 40% will be collected in quarter three. We add these across, we get 1.8 million. 1.8 million, great. So, so far we've collected all the six and all the 1.8. I'll get back to this number here, don't worry. The uh, 180 that we have here. Third quarter sales, our next entry, 2.4 million at 60% will be collected in the third quarter. 40% will be collected in the fourth quarter. Sum these two together, we get 2.4 million. There's our 2.4 million. Fourth quarter sales, 1.2 million, 60% is collected. Notice we don't deal with the 40 because the 40 is collected in the next quarter, which is the first quarter of 2016. This is just the budget for 2015. So. We end the year collecting 720,000 of the 1.2 million. The other 480,000 becomes the ending amount in accounts receivable for December 31st, 2015, when we get to the budgeted balance sheet. Now that we know that what we end the year with becomes the accounts receivable, which will be collected in the first quarter, it stands to reason that whatever the accounts receivable were as of the year ending December 31st, 2014, gets collected in the first quarter of 2015. That's why we have our first entry, accounts receivable from last year. We expect to collect all of that plus 60% of this year of, of this quarter sales, we'll collect 540,000. Even though we're selling 600, we only collect 540 because we collect 180 from last year, 240, we don't collect in this quarter, we collect next quarter. So this line, total cash collections, is what we expect to collect in cash. This gets entered into the cash budget this top line of 20,000, 60,000, 80,000, 40,000 gets entered in the production budget. So when we start with the sales budget, we've already got one line of our production budget done, we've got one line of our cash budget done, and we've solved for the ending balance of accounts receivable. So it, I think it's clear that if you don't start with sales, you can't do the production or the cash budget. 
And if you can't do the production budget, you can't do the raw materials budget, the direct labor budget, or the manufacturing overhead budget. So your sales budget is the first one to get done. Yeah.